When magazine publishing giant Condé Nast suddenly shut down Gourmet Magazine, food enthusiast, terrific cook and formidable restaurant critic Ruth Reichel found herself out of work, shocked and unmoored. For 10 years, Reichel was the editor-in-chief of Gourmet Magazine. Before that, she honed her writing skills as restaurant critic for the LA and for the New York Times, and she wrote some tasty best-selling memoirs. In 2009, when she found herself with no day job, she decided to do something that scared her, which was to write a work of fiction. Her motto is, when you're in trouble, do the hardest thing, the thing you don't know if you can do or not. Her debut novel is Baked. It's called Delicious. It is my pleasure to welcome Ruth Reichel to Canada with no disguise. It's great to be here. People who know about you know that often when you went to a restaurant uh, to decide what the food was really all about and the service, you wore wigs and glasses and brought your alter ego. Yeah, I and mean, I didn't just wear wigs and glasses. I mean, I, I inhabited somebody else. I mean, each of my characters had their own wardrobe, their own uh, credit cards, their own jewelry. They had different nails. I, I did. It was very elaborate. Were you inventive as a child? I was not actually. I mean, this did not come naturally to me. But when I found out that every restaurant in New York had a photograph of me. And I said, okay, if they know who I am, I have to be someone else. I called up a friend who was an acting coach and said, where do I get a wig? And she went, come on, Ruth. You're going to be the restaurant critic of the New York Times. You can't just put on a wig and funny glasses. You have to do that. And so she came, she said, wait a minute, I'll be right there. And she came over and she said, who are you going to be? And so I just pulled a name out of the air. I said, Molly Hollis. And she said, okay. Who is Molly? Where does she live? What does she do? What do her children do? And before she let me go out to a restaurant, she really made me inhabit this person. And we went shopping. And so when the first time I went out as Molly, um, I really was this, you know, Midwestern woman who I had I had like layers of clothing, so I was much larger than I am normally. <laughs> Well, you married to Hollis. I did. I did. So I, I had sort of based this person on my first mother-in-law. I see. Did, did she know? Uh, she was no longer with us. But she was a lovely, very modest mm -hmm. woman. Very much not, you know, the New Yorker that I am. Well, a lovely, modest woman goes into a restaurant. No one knows her. Uh, the service can be a bit shabby, as you know. And the service was. I mean, you know, I walked up to, you know, look, say, say I was there and asked for my seat, and they, the maitre d' pretended that he couldn't find the reservation. Oh. I mean, he did not want Molly in his, in his restaurant, and it was a terrible experience. I'm sure. And your early interest in food. My early interest in food came from the fact that my mother was not just a bad cook, but a scary one. I mean, really. I, I mean, my earliest memory is watching my mother go through the refrigerator, scraping the blue stuff off the top and saying, little mold never hurt anyone. How about when she made everything stew? Well, that was her favorite day. She was frugal. And, you know, she believed that as long as everything in it was good, it didn't matter how you combined things. So I was watching her make her famous everything stew one day, and she threw in some old green beans and um, some old turkey and some cheese, and she, you know, she finds some onions, she throws that in. And then all of a sudden, she throws in half an apple pie. And I said, Mom, <laughs> she said, oh, it'll be delicious. And she sort of mixed it all up, threw it in the oven. and. You learn to taste very carefully. Mm -hmm. So, in self-defense, you became a terrific cook. Um, well, I don't think I was terrific to start with. Right. But Who is? Uh, yeah. But if you're seven and you're cooking, everybody thinks it's adorable. And so, you know, you get encouragement and they keep telling you mm -hmm. what a great cook you are, no matter how bad it is. And after a while, you become a great cook. Okay. But you didn't go to culinary school. You went to the University of Michigan. Right. Took art history. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I think art history is a very good opening for cooking. I mean, I, in my notes when I was in graduate school, you know, I, you know, oh. Dr. Eisenberg says, after you look at the Jottos, go around the corner and there's a great little trattoria. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, in the pursuit of art history, I went to Europe a lot. And, you know, in those days, you could be in Europe on three dollars a day. Exactly. And food is art. And plating, all, art. All of that, absolutely. Uh, and so yummy. <laughs> yeah, all of it. So, uh, when a magazine like Gourmet shuts down and you don't see it coming, what do you do? Cry and drink? Uh, just for <laughs> starters. Much. For starters, you cry and drink. And then, actually, for the next year, I just went back into the kitchen. I mean, I had not been able oh. to cook. I had, had, I had these really intense jobs, and I hadn't been cooking much. And so, for the first year, I really just went into the kitchen. I mean, I started wandering around, going to farmers markets, picking up ingredients, taking them back, and making things, and sort of regrounding myself. And I came out of that year sort of realizing that my life wasn't over, it was, it was time to move on. And I thought, I've always, you know, fiction is, it's my, my most necessary thing. If I never had another item of clothing, it would be fine with me. If I didn't have nice furniture, it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. but if you told me I could never read another novel, I think I'd shoot myself. Okay, we don't want you to do that, <laughs> but I know you're a fan of historical fiction, uh, Toni Morrison, George Eliot. Uh, and a lot of contemporary fiction, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, 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 sort of, I sort of read voraciously everything. I figured that out, having read Delicious, because you did a lot of research, or someone did a lot of research about the war. Oh, no, no, I did it. There, the there, there was no someone. <laughs> okay, you did it, because yeah. essentially you're a journalist. Right, and, uh -huh. and you know, I mean, the thing about writing fiction is it's very different than writing journalism, or it is for me. I don't uh -huh. know what is the case for other people. Um, and you know, when I went to my editor and said, you know, I'm not sure I can do this, she said, look, she said, your memoirs read like novels, but more than that, um, when you were inhabiting these other characters, you weren't writing fiction, but you were living it. Just use that experience. Mm. And I went into my studio and I thought, okay, if I could be Molly Hollis and Chloe and all these people uh -huh. I invented, I can do this on the page. But I needed a kind of quiet to do it. It's, it's waiting. You're just waiting for the character to inhabit you. And when it doesn't happen, I would do research. And I would just, you know, sort of Google around and think, okay, you know, I'm going to research um, World War II and uh -huh. how they ate during World War II and federal architecture and antique locks. So, you know, it was a wonderful balance um, on the days when you just can't force uh -huh. the writing to happen. And all of that is wrapped in Delicious. Delicious essentially is about? It's about Billy Breslin, who's a 21-year-old who has had a family tragedy, comes to New York, goes to work at a magazine. The magazine closes. I wonder why that happened. <laughs> um, and she stays on to um, answer letters and so forth. And in the course of that, she discovers some hidden letters that were written during World War II by a little girl in Akron, Ohio, to James Beard. Lulu. Lulu. Yes. Mm -hmm. Only 12, writing letters to James Beard. And uh, we won't tell any secrets because it is a novel. But often uh, uh, we write what we know. So people will ask and have asked you, is Billy Breslin you? Billy Breslin is so not me. Um, you know, I was trying, I mean, I've written four memoirs. I don't need mm. to write another no. autobiographical thing. So, which is why I chose someone who's 21, which I clearly am not, who is, she's a Californian, I'm from New York. She has a sister who's very important to her. I've never had a sister. Um, and, you know, e even though I said it in a magazine which was familiar to me, um, I chose to write about a character who is abundantly not me. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think she was. But you did work in a cheese shop. I, I have never worked in a cheese shop. Oh, I thought shop. you did. No, and which is, I've always wanted to. Okay. So I let Billy go, you know, she, she has a lot of things that I would like. For instance, she has a perfect palate, which I do not. 
uh, that palette. And uh, the the one great character in the book, Sal Fontenary. Yes. Sal Fontenary has the cheese shop, and he has the love of the salami and the cheese and the process. Uh, he's loosely based on um, a couple of real characters. Mm. Um, and um, the cheese shop is loosely based on a shop in New York that I've been going to since I was my whole life um, called De Palos. And, um, you know, I mean, I, in, in many ways, this is an homage to the artisans. Um, mm. I mean, I, I think that the people who, you know, really understand cheese and the bakers and the butchers are so important. And it seems to be a trend today. It's coming back, artisanal cheese and vinegars and all of that. Yeah. In New York, too? Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, you know, these old you know, shops like De Palos, which have been around for a long time, which were sort of fading, now we're starting to understand that they're a really important part of urban life. And, and that we need to celebrate them. And shopping daily instead of doing one big shop and going to the market and picking the porchetta when the porchetta is done, that kind of thing, is such a joy, really. It is, it is, and you know, in New York we don't have a choice because we have such small apartments, we don't, mm. you know, other people can go to the supermarket and put, put all that stuff in their great big refrigerators, but we have little tiny refrigerators, so we do have to shop every day. When you grew up in Greenwich Village, yes. a tiny refrigerator or no, no, tiny, tiny refrigerator, tiny mm -hmm. kitchen. Um, you know, my mother actually went out. The, she was a terrible cook, but she did go out every morning and get fresh bread and rolls for breakfast. Really? Yeah. And and there was a deli or two. I'm assuming. Oh yes, yeah, so we right around the corner. So somebody else could do the cooking. Exactly. Now the part that is true, I'm assuming, in Delicious is how a magazine works, how you put a glossy together, how you put a food magazine together, how you change it when it's not working. Yeah, I mean this I mean I did draw on gourmet for the test kitchen scenes. I mean we had um, a test kitchen very much like the one that figures largely in Delicious. And I wanted to put Billy in, because she's in trouble, and I wanted to put her in the most nurturing atmosphere I could think of, and that would be an Epicurean magazine. You know, food people are, by nature, very generous. If a Billy had shown up at Gourmet, we would have gathered around her and tried to make her appreciate herself. But it, I'm assuming, and I've never worked in the magazine business, but it's a collaborative. It's the most collaborative. Atmosphere. It's the most collaborative work that you can possibly have. Mm. I mean, um, you know, you start with an idea for an issue, and you have a meeting, and everybody comes together and throws in, you know, we should do this and we should do that, and you discuss it. And I remember after every meeting thinking, it's going to be so interesting to see what we end up with, you know, because everybody adds something to it and. You assign stories and sometimes there are disappointments, mm -hmm. so you throw them out and think, you know, how am I going to replace this? And then the art director gets his hands on it and does something really imaginative that you could not have conceived. Um, you know, it was, it was so exciting working mm -hmm. there and, you know, being surrounded by these wonderfully creative people. Well, and you created a new type of gourmet magazine, really, on your watch. Were you shocked when they said, you have all these readers and fans, but we're done? Yeah, I was, I, I never saw, I mean, the idea that you would close a magazine when it was its, at its highest circulation ever, when its renewal rates were off the charts, when the readers obviously loved it, you're in a recession, advertising is challenging, but you know, at the point where advertising is controlling a beloved, mm -hmm. A, a beloved magazine like that, there's something wrong with the model. There is with that model, and it's everywhere, as you know, because you can't write a, uh, an article about bad pork and expect an advertiser to want to be plunked beside that article, especially a pig advertiser. Well, that's right, and, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of articles that were edgy and, mm -hmm. you know, un look, Advertisers would like you to do the most innocuous, safe thing, you know, tell people how to spend their money is right. what advertisers would mm -hmm. really like. So if you get a writer like David Foster Wallace who does a difficult piece about lobsters and what they feel going into the pot, 
you know, all the advertisers are going, no, 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 I, I don't want to be in that article. No, and I don't want to be a lobster. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ruth Reichel, our guest, her, her first novel, her debut novel is called Delicious.